your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11, and we're uh, continuing in our series, Looking Unto Jesus, A Faith That Perseveres. And uh, we're dealing specifically now as we finish out the uh, end of the chapter, which we will not do so today, uh, but I, we are looking at uh, the superior courage that a life of faith is going to represent. Uh, we've often and have already experienced in our own lives many of the same struggles and the challenges uh, that life brings. I think it's a great encouragement to know that uh, we are not alone in these things. And other men have gone on before and ladies have gone on before and, and have faced some very challenging and difficult times. This has been a, a chapter, I remember when I first started looking into it, I thought, wow, you know, I'm just going to, we're going to not get bogged down in the details of this. Hey, every, every week I'd say, all right, we're going we're gonna to really advance through this. And, and honestly, I, I know it's a joke. I, yeah, you know, you're going to run through it quickly. I know that's a joke and I understand that. But I honestly will say every week uh, the Lord has just put the brakes on and said, you, you just need to slow down. And uh, because so many times we read through the scriptures and we fail to really grasp what it is that's being taught. We pass through the words, we read names, and, and we give very little thought to it. And so tonight we want to deal with specifically what I've titled the unsung heroes. Notice the Bible begins this and it'll actually continue all the way through the remainder, but we're going to look at just verse 32 tonight. The Bible says, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel, let me continue reading through the text, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, Quench the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. We'll stop the reading there. I don't anticipate us getting, however, beyond uh, the individuals who are mentioned there uh, in verse number 32. Scripture is filled with examples of men and women who simply believed God. Their stories may not be as well known as that of Abraham or as that of Moses, but yet they are stories that still are very challenging and I would even say inspiring. But yet, as a preacher, I would say most of the ones that are mentioned in verse 32, I probably would not have included in the examples of faith. In fact, many of these individuals that are mentioned in verse 32 actually struggled significantly with their faith, struggled with the confidence and, and all of that uh, that's there. And it becomes very obvious as we look at this passage and as I think we probably look even in our own lives, God does not do things the way we often would. It's, we know it's better. We have no doubt about that. I don't think that's a, a truth that, that our minds struggle to comprehend. But the reality is God does not do things the way that we often would or sometimes even the way we think he should. Uh, you want to talk about the uh, epitome of arrogance is demanding that God do things the way you think they should be done. Uh, that's a whole other message in and of itself, but Scripture is very clear as we find repeatedly that God doesn't do things the way that we think He should. Isaiah chapter 55, a very well-known passage, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts." God's ability to comprehend and God's ability to perceive the big picture, so to speak, is something that is far greater than you and I will ever be able to understand. Amen. God doesn't do things the way that you and I think that he should. Here's another passage, James chapter number 2 and verse 5. James says, hearken or listen, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. 
Do you know God often does not, or, or God has taken and, and chosen as a general rule to use those who, from a world standpoint, would have very little to be able to offer them? But yet they are described, as James points out, they may be poor in this world, poor as far as the world's standards, but yet they are rich in faith. There is a poverty as man would define it. But there's a whole nother dimension to their life that the unsaved don't understand. And that dimension is how rich they are in faith. A lengthy passage is contained in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul wrote, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh... Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Is God saying that a, a mighty person or a noble person is incapable of being saved? Absolutely not. But as a general rule, who do they trust in? Themselves. Not in God. But God hath chosen. God has made this decision that the foolish things of the world would confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. These people don't have a chance, says the world. That's just the one God's looking for. We'll see this illustrated time after time after time. That person, he can't fight his way out of a wet paper bag. God can use him. He doesn't have the eloquence that that person has. God can use him. He doesn't have the courage that that person has. God can use him. He doesn't have the wealth that that person has. God can take and go beyond all of that. God has done so repeatedly. He has done so throughout all of time. He continues on. He has chosen base things of the world. And things which are despised doesn't mean things which are hated. Things which are esteemed lightly. There's no value there. Do you know how many times adults discount children because they are just that? Children, I have for much of my life always, and this is not a, in any way a bragging thing, I found myself in positions that most people my age weren't there, okay? And I heard all of my life, well, he's awfully young to be that. Much of my life heard that. I guess the gray hair in my goatee maybe is starting to change some of that. If I were to, to be it young... In comparison, I'm one of the youngest guys there, okay? I used to be the youngest, but I'm not anymore. Uh, I'm going to fire that one, though. But, um, you know, it's one of the things I look at when we're training. Are you younger than me? Uh, no. Yeah, sorry. You're, sorry, you're just not the candidate here. No, but I am very young as far as that. I mean, guys have 30 years on me driving, Okay. And I've been put into different positions and I've heard well, the, the experience and all of those things. As adults, we often do the same thing to teenagers. Let's be very careful because God is perfectly capable of using them in a very powerful fashion. God has chosen things which are not, as the passage continues in verse 28, to bring to naught things that are, and this is the key, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Do you know it's not about you? It's not about what you're able to accomplish. It's not about what you're able to bring to the table. It is instead all about what God has done. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let me use a different word. He that boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Volumes and volumes and volumes could be written if we would simply boast in what God's done for us. You try to 
bring that down to a time frame of your life that you're going to be able to accomplish explaining and boasting to everybody what God's done in your life. I think it's probably fair to say if you examine your life as I do mine, I have a lot of focus on myself. A lot of focus on me and on my talents and on my energy or my ability or my management of this or my lack of management of this. It's not about us. It's about God. And these individuals that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter number 11 illustrate this truth perfectly. When we conclude this chapter, what we find is that the focus of faith is always on God. Always. It's not on individuals. It's not on the work that man accomplishes. The focus that belongs in the realm of faith is a focus that is always going to be on God. And when that focus is always on God, the result is that the praise always goes to God. That's where it has to be. Because the reality is the work that these men accomplished in verse 32 and the work of those who are going to be unnamed later on. It's not about who they were. It's not even necessarily about what they did. It is ultimately about God and what God did. And that's where this entire focus goes. We lose sight of this very easily. When we allow our focus to be improperly directed to a person, we will find we will improperly praise and even exalt that person. When we take and direct our focus to some amazing work, once again the focus is from where it needs to be. I've taken groups to different places to see how they do things. I'm not saying that there isn't necessarily benefit in this. Companies, for example, will often send various employees to another plant and to see how they do things. Maybe there are ways that we can streamline and become more efficient and our production can increase like this corporation or this plant over here. I've done the same thing for churches, interestingly enough. There can be value in going to another ministry to see how they do things and see if maybe there are ways of improving things. But the danger certainly is very real to put that work up on a pedestal as a pattern that is to be followed because it simply is a large church. And since they have, and some of these will boast of uh, one that I'm thinking in particular, anywhere from 4,000 to 6,000 on a Sunday. It's a lot of people. Let's say, and I don't know the nature of the, the entire ministry, so I'm not going to criticize it or anything like that. Let's say that that is the work that God is doing there. Is that work special or is it God behind the work that gets the focus? And you see how quickly our perspective can be drawn to the wrong place? The author of Hebrews recognizes, you know, I've gone down through this list of people, most of whom are very well known up to this point. And he comes to a conclusion, a conclusion this list is too great. What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell. <laughs> it's as though he maybe set his pen down and began pondering. I could go on and on and on. 
with individuals whom God has chosen to use and prove the point that the life of faith is a superior life. But he recognizes there's not enough time. The time would fail me to tell. There's insufficient time for me to be able to come along and give detailed accounts of all of the lives of faith. And so, because of that, he chooses to list individuals and never mention the specific acts that they accomplished. He ends up turning it around and mentions specific acts that are accomplished and never gives them specific names. Some of these I'd like to know. Okay, one for example, and I know what um, verse 37, uh, they were sawn asunder, cut in half. Now I know that historically Isaiah is said to have died that way. Who was that? <laughs> I'd like to know. But you know what? It's not about the who. It's not about the work that's accomplished. It's ultimately about God. Before I move on and, and get into Gideon, let me mention to you, any work that is accomplished through this ministry, the praise must go to God. This is God's work. It always has been. It always will be. There may be different individuals who lead it, but it is ultimately God's work. And it is ultimately God who is the one to be praised. The first one we come across, and he, after saying, I don't have the time to get into all of these, so he just mentions some by name, Gideon. Gideon and the Midianites. Well, there, as you go back and, and look, and we're not going to take the time to turn to the various passages. I'll pull many of the verses up on the screen. It was a significant time of need that Gideon was there. The Bible describes the Midianites. The, the hand of the Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Why would they make a den? To hide. This was the reality, the oppression that they were faced with. And so it was when Israel saw that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till they come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. You put yourself into this scene. You've gone and you've worked, you've planted your crops, you know the work if you've ever gardened, you understand the work that goes into it. If you're going to have a successful garden, there's a lot of work that goes into it. If you just plant the seeds and let it go, you're probably not going to have a whole lot other than weeds. Okay? Uh, but as far as fruit, you're not going to have a whole lot of that. But you go through all of the work, and right when it's time to harvest it, somebody else comes and harvests it. And there's nothing you can do about it because of the multitude of people. Have you ever gone through all the work of a particular project for somebody else to receive the praise and the credit for it? Frustrating. Irritating. The children of Israel were greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And so there was one whom I would describe as a very unlikely person. But it was a, during this time of need that God chose to bring a man by the name of Gideon. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. But interestingly, he's behind a wine press using that for cover to thresh the wheat. Man of faith seems like a man of fear. To Gideon, 
it seemed as though God had forsaken them. In fact, Gideon is quite honest with God and says, you know, Lord, when, when I look at all this, how are we not supposed to conclude that you've forsaken us? Sometimes the circumstances of life seem to indicate that God doesn't care or that God has left you alone. You have to, in those points of time, bring your mind back to the truth of the word of God. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Gideon was told, you're going to be the guy that will deliver Israel from the Midianites. And he said, oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. I, I can't do this. Lord, you've got to be crazy. An encounter with God. Then it leads to a step of growth. Judges chapter 6, as the passage continues on, you find in verse 25 that the same night the Lord said, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. You put yourself into this situation. Your father has erected an altar of Baal. The grove would be a wooden image that would be beside it. You take and tear that down, Gideon. Well, the Bible says that he did so. He took ten men and he did so at night. Did as the Lord had said unto them. And it was so because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. You know what I see in this? God had to take Gideon from hiding behind a wine press, threshing wheat, to being willing to conquer an innumerable army with 300 people. It doesn't happen overnight. As I read the account of Judges chapter 6, I believe that it was an account that God used as a growth process. Gideon had to become confident that God would truly protect him. Gideon needed to be challenged with the truth, would you obey me even if it's difficult? And there's no doubt this was difficult. I see this, and I never saw it this way until my study uh, going into this message. I see this as a step that God used to prepare Gideon for the challenge that he had coming. Let me point out to you, God always prepares us for the next step. Always. God doesn't take you from behind the wine press, hiding from the Midianites to all of a sudden conquering an innumerable army with 300 people. God doesn't do things that way. God grows us to the point and he allows our confidence to be placed in him to this reality that all of a sudden, now I've got what it takes to be able to do what God's asked me to do. I trusted God here. I'll trust him here. And it's a step. And as I see this passage, I see that this thing with 10 people as a step that God used for his growth. Then we come, if we were going through the passage, we would come to the infamous incident of the fleece in Judges chapter 6. You're probably familiar with that. Many use the passage and the use of a fleece to try to determine God's will. But you know, if you were to study this passage, you would find that's not at all what it was actually taking place. God had already indicated his will. Okay? God indicated his will. It was used not to determine God's will. It was used to confirm God's will. 
there's a lot of difference there. I hear a lot of Christians today who, well, I put this fleece out before the Lord that if he wants me to have that job, that he'll, he'll have them call me right back. I put a fleece out before the Lord that if he wants me to go into Krispy Kreme Donuts, the hot and now sign will be on. After two hours in the parking lot, God finally agreed to turn the sign on, okay, right? It's used to confirm. Let me point out to you also what he asked him to do was supernatural. What most Christians are asking when they're doing this isn't supernatural. I just illustrated it with the hot and now sign. It's going to come on. I might have to wait a while, okay? That's not supernatural. What Gideon asked God to do was supernatural. As the story progresses, you find that Gideon had an army of 32,000 people. And his first test, all right, well, you know what? If any of you are afraid, you can go ahead and leave. 22,000 gone. 10,000 left. That's not seeming all that great. In fact, the Midianites are described, Judges chapter 7, they lay like grasshoppers for multitude. Their camels were without number. We can't count the soldiers. Man, forget counting the soldiers. We can't even count their camels. 22,000 just left. I've got 10,000 and God comes to him and says, it's still too many. Goes down, does the test of how you're going to drink water from a creek. If you ever drink water from a creek, be careful. God may be testing you. Okay. You better do so right. Uh, I'm surprised I'm still alive. Some of the water I drank from creeks. Uh, but anyway, when it was all said and done, 300 men. God used 300 to blow trumpets. And the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. Who granted the deliverance? God did. What do we learn from Gideon? Very quickly, faith is not overcome by fear. Did Gideon have some fear? Yeah. You know, fear is not always a, a wrong thing. But when it paralyzes us to the point when we don't obey, when we don't trust, now we've allowed fear to overtake our faith. Faith does not, is not overcome by fear. Secondly, faith places its confidence in God to do what is impossible. The verse at the Bottom of our prayer list tonight, Job chapter 42 and verse 2. I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Can God do everything? Let me ask you this. Do you really believe it? <laughs> I believe it until he gives me something that seems impossible. And I'm not quite so sure. Then it's more like in my own heart and in my own mind, well, Lord, I, th I thought you could do everything. Job says, I know you can do everything. Goes on to another story, and I'll have to hurry. Barak and the Canaanites, Judges chapter 4, if you were to go back and read the account. He lived while a lady was the judge of Israel, a lady by the name of Deborah. Uh, she was also a prophetess, and, and she came to him, and she called Barak and said, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulon, and I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into his hand. Barak actually lived before uh, Gideon. Take 10,000 and go to the, the Mount Tabor. And God says, I will bring them right to you. <laughs> As you read through Judges chapter number 4, he tells Deborah, uh, I'll go ahead and go as long as you go with me. 
man of faith? You see, would you use him as an example? God commends him for his faith. Deborah says, well, I'll tell you, I'll go. But let me tell you, you're not going to get the credit for this because the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. You're going to be the mighty military leader, but you're not going to get the praise for this. You still interested in going? So he takes 10,000 men and they go to Mount Tabor. And, and as you read the account in Judges 4, as soon as the Canaanites realized that that's where they were going, sure enough, they set the battle into array. And as the battle progressed, all of a sudden, uh, you find that, again, God does the impossible. And as Sisera gets off of his chariot and off he goes, he turns to rest into a tent of a lady by the name of Jael. And Jael takes and drives a tent stake right through his head, fastens him to the ground. Man. Man. It is some cool stories in the Bible. I totally agree with that. Another one I think is pretty cool is when Ehud is stabbed and, or stabs Eglon the king and, and loses his sword. <laughs> uh, great, man, that's a nice sword. Uh, ladies, all I'm going to tell, or men, all I can say is uh, keep in mind, don't anger your spouse. You will go to sleep at some point in time, <laughs> okay? And uh, I'll tell you what, I don't know how all it happened, but that must have been one solid hit the first time, okay? And uh, there he goes, stuck, not going anywhere, right through the temple, right into the ground. A very graphic story. You know what? Faith doesn't seek selfish praise and attention. Barak said, I'll do it. It's not about me. For many the work that they engage themselves in is exactly that. It's all about them. Another man, Samson. you got to be kidding me. Samson? When you think of Samson, muscles, long hair, and women. Success? Very little. Faith? I would think almost non-existent. If it weren't for this passage, you would find difficulty commending Samson until the end of his life. He judged Israel for 20 years. That's a thought that often we, we kind of lose sight of. Okay, He was their judge for 20 years. And his motives were obviously not always pure. In fact, they were often selfish. But he did realize that the source of his strength was God. And he realized the connection with his hair. He knew that it was from God. In fact, God was ultimately the one who was behind all of his uh, powerful and even single-handed exploits. Just notice some of these scripture passages. I'm going to pull them up very quickly. Judges 14 and verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he rent him, that is a lion, as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand. He, he ripped the lion in half. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> okay. That's a hard thing to do. Uh, Judges 14, verse 9, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went to Ashkelon and slew 30 men. Uh, Judges chapter 15, he, he came into Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became his flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loose from off his hand. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand men. Good night, can't somebody get this guy? I mean, a thousand, surely a thousand can get it. No. A little passage continues on. He was sore thirsty, he called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into, thy, into the hand of thy servant. Isn't it interesting? Samson recognized where the deliverance came from and gave the credit to God. And he asked, Now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? And God Clave in a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water there out. Who was behind all this, God? 
Judges chapter number 16 and verse 20, he woke out of his sleep. This is with, with, with Delilah. And he said, I'll go out as at other times and shake myself. And he wist not, he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. Something was different. Later on, Judges 16, verse 28. Now here he is in the temple and he called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged for the Philistines for my two eyes. And you know, he killed more in that Judges chapter 16 than he did combined throughout his entire life when they brought the whole temple down. Man of faith, not necessarily by my standards, but here's what I learned. God chooses to use those who trust him in spite of failure, sometimes in spite of frequent failure. Aren't you thankful? God uses us I'm a long way from perfect. I may joke about it. You know as well as I know, I'm a long way from it. How humbling and how praiseworthy to God that he chooses to use us in spite of our failures. Yep, without me, you can do nothing. Excellent point. Goes on and it goes to a man by the name of Jephthah. Of all of them, he's probably one of the most unknown ones. Jephthah fought the Ammonites. Jephthah the Gileadite, Judges chapter 11, was a mighty man of valor. But notice, he was the son of a harlot. You know how this guy came about? Through an immoral relationship. Guys, God uses anybody. Okay? And when we start looking down on people, we've got way too high a view of ourselves. We have forgotten what God has chosen to use with us. We've forgotten what God chose to save when he saved us. We get all these ideas and we look down on people sometimes. This ministry, if it weren't for people, is non-existent. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, it's not too exciting around here. Okay? Please don't tell me, well, Sunday's not either, okay? I hope that it is, all right? But uh, you, you look at, God, this whole ministry is about the people. Amen. Well, Gilead's wife bare him sons. His wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said, Thou shalt not inherit our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Jephthah, you had not got any part with us. You go on your own. Eventually, they discovered they needed him. Hey, Jephthah. Can you come back and lead us against the Ammonites? And Jeff says, are you crazy? This is my version, by the way. You're crazy. You cast me out. You didn't need me then, but you need me now. How do I know that you're, you're actually going to follow me? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll follow you. Well, Jeff, probably what he's most well known for was a very foolish vow that he made. He prayed and said, Lord, if if you'll give me this victory, then I'll sacrifice to you whatever comes out of my house first. I don't know what he expected to come out of his house, but it was his daughter. And uh, lots of commentators are divided, and I'm not going to get into that uh, as to whether he literally sacrificed or, or, or not. I'm not going to get into all of those debates. But in spite of a very foolish vow, Jephthah still trusted God for the victory. He passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them. And guess what? The Lord delivered them into his hands. David. David was testified in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. I found David, the son of Jesse. This is God speaking, a man after mine own heart. Man, what a testimony. Which shall fulfill all my will. David constantly trusted God in spite of adversity. As a young boy, he was trusted God for the deliverance from a lion and from a bear. Two separate occasions. He trusted God for deliverance from Goliath. He trusted God for deliverance from Saul. During David's reign as king, Israel expanded to an unprecedented height. David trusted God. There's another one who's mentioned in Hebrews 11 and verse 32, a man by the name of Samuel occupied a very unique place in history. 
He was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. But his battle was unlike any of the others because it was a battle against his own people. His own people came and said, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And Samuel said, That's not right. But that's what we want. He said, That's not right. And he went and he poured out his heart before the Lord and said, Lord, they, this isn't right. They can't want this. And God said, give them what they want. Let me caution you. Be careful what you ask for. You may get it. Okay. Yep. You may very well get exactly what God, what you've been asking God for. And God says, go ahead and give it. Why? Because they've not rejected you, they've rejected me. So go ahead and give it to them. And Samuel went to them and he said, you know what? You're going to get a king, but you're not going to like it. Samuel stood against the social pressures of his people, his own people. And he warned them of their rebellion. He warned them of the consequences. And they faced exactly that under the reign of Saul. Difficult battle. Sometimes standing against those that you are close to is one of the most challenging battles we face. I've never had to fight the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Amalekites, and people as many as, mult, as, as grasshoppers and with camels like the, size, like the seashore. But I've had to make stands before in front of people at work, and it's hard. Okay? It's very difficult. God will give the grace, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Okay? And sometimes these battles are very challenging. Yeah? Family? Same point. Okay? Unsaved family, sometimes saved family. It's a hard thing. Sometimes the world feels awfully lonely, doesn't it? In spite of all the inhabitants. Then it goes to the prophets. You've got to love the prophets. They faithfully proclaimed, thus saith the Lord to a rebellious people who seldom heeded their unpopular message. <laughs> Did they see the fruit? No. They experienced the persecution that came with it. Were they able to write a, a, a book on how to preach a successful message? Uh, nope. Fastest growing churches, go back to the prophets. <laughs> uh, it didn't happen there. Sometimes the messages are very difficult. We're reminded in 2 Timothy chapter 4, preach the word. The instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Folks, the time in which we live is a difficult time to preach the word of God. We can preach it when it's easy here in our services. Relatively speaking, it's easy to an unsaved person who is in a life of sin and you tell them they're wrong. That's not easy. And it's not going to get easier. It's going to be harder. I told you when we started this, men that we could just read over very quickly and never think about. But look at the lessons we're able to glean from them. Look at the truths that when we just stop for just a little while and, and ponder what their lives actually were like, they're no different than you and I are. They faced the same battles, the same frustrations of life. They understood what it was like to work and work and work and work and still lose everything. They understood what it was like to have a message that nobody seemed to even care about. They understood what it was like to, to share the truth of God's word and to be laughed at, to be mocked, and even persecuted for it. They understood what it was like to be faced with incredible circumstances that you don't see any way out of. They understood all this. But faith was the key that opened up that door. The songwriter phrased it well when he said, faith is the victory. That's the key. Trust God. Amen. Maybe you're discouraged. 
Maybe you're disheartened at what it is that you're faced with or who it is that you're faced against, whatever it may be. Pour out your heart before God. And you'll find some, you'll find God do some amazing things. It's not to say that it's always going to end the way you always want it to. Sometimes it may, sometimes it may not. But you can rest assured that when you take and pour out your heart before God, that God hears and God answers. I was recently challenged with a situation where I had to, to have a very difficult conversation with an individual. And um, wasn't necessarily, it wasn't in the, in the pastoral world, um, but it wasn't necessarily a conversation that in some ways it was mine to have, but in other ways it wasn't mine to have. And I made that conversation a significant matter of prayer. Sure enough, first thing one morning, it greeted me just like I knew that it would. And when it was all said and done, I was able to relate well to the individual that I had to have the conversation with. And when it was all said and done, this was what I was told. Thank you for telling me what you said. Since that incident, I've been thinking everything you said I've already thought. And this was the God part in this. He said, you didn't say anything additional that I haven't thought. And he said, you didn't miss a single thing that I haven't been thinking over the last several days. My point in it is to say this. Take those things to God and let God do the work. It's a lot easier. I could have handled it out of frustration, and trust me, there was that point of me. And so you know what? Uh, now is not the time. Now is the time for me to bite my tongue. <laughs> okay? And not say what I really, 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 really want to say, because I have a Sunday school lesson on anger that's coming up. Okay? Uh, no way am I going to be that illustration. I'm going to use someone else as that illustration this Sunday. All right? But you, it was in God's hands. And what you'll find is that when you take those things to God, and leave them there. You'll understand the essence of 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, casting all your care upon him, because he careth for you. Man, what an amazing truth. Lord, thank you for...